I'll tell you a secret if you promise not to tell. I have to tell someone at this point. I don't really care who I tell, just as long as you, you promise not to judge me. I feel so alone and I, I hate everything about me. It's just, it's too hard to be me and life really isn't worth living. It's, it's too hard to be me. My only means of escape is cutting and self-mutilation. That's, that's where I'm free. That's, that's where I feel okay about me. That's where I don't hurt, if only for a minute. Don't, don't judge me. Don't look at me. Not like, not like that. I don't know. I don't know anything. Not, not anymore. These are my friend Josh's words that he said to me. My friend Josh is 17 years old. He cuts himself on a regular basis and has attempted suicide 13 times. My friend Kristen, she is 13 years old. She has been pregnant and had an abortion. My friend David, he's 14. He cuts himself and is addicted to pornography and other sexual sins. My friend Tyler is 17 years old. He cuts himself and is addicted to marijuana, LSD, and is not a virgin. Now you may ask me why I associate myself with such depraved and broken young people. And the answer is, you do too. My friend Joshua comes from a strong Christian family. He's an award-winning speaker and debater, singer, pianist, swimmer, and even an Eagle Scout. My friend Kristen, she excels in gymnastics. She's at the top of her class and is on her way to the Olympics. My friend David, he comes from a Christian family. He works in his family's restaurant, and I know him to be a thoughtful and caring individual. My friend Tyler comes from a strong Christian family. He's an award-winning speaker and debater. He's extremely intelligent, and my mother describes him as a winner. With these just four heartbreaking stories that I personally have encountered among my friends, I had to ask myself why so many of my friends, Christian young people, are so broken and struggling with so much. Now I understand that teenagers can struggle for many reasons, but the one reason in particular that I would like to focus on today is when Christian families strive to raise excellent young people, sometimes they ignore who God made their child to be, forcing him or her to do things they were not made to do, destroying the child in the process. We will be talking about who these teenagers are, why they are broken, and finally how to stop this trend and continue having healthy teenagers. And looking at who they are, we will be addressing two myths. The first myth says, these are someone else's kids, not mine. And the second myth says that these teens are not in the church or among the Christian community. Addressing the first myth that these are someone else's kids, not mine, let's look at some statistics first. Regarding teen sexuality, the United States has the highest levels of teen pregnancy among developed nations. This is hardly surprising since nearly 56% of all 15 to 19 year olds in the United States have had sex at least once already. And 27% of pregnancies among 15 to 19 year olds end in abortion. Regarding teen drug use, 114 million children under the age of 18 report to, per to uh, using illicit drugs at least once in their lifetime. Today, 6,000 children under the age of 18 will begin smoking. And of those 6,000, 2,000 will become regular and addicted smokers. Regarding pornography, 70 million children aged 12 through 17 in the United States, or half the teen population in America, report to purposely visiting internet porn sites this year. And of those, hardly surprising, 90% indicate they keep their online porn addiction and porn use a secret from their parents. Regarding suicide, 1 in 12 teens has attempted suicide this year, and suicide is the third leading cause of death for 15 to 20 year olds. While these are just a few problems and they leave us staggering, parents seem to overwhelmingly believe that somehow their children are immune to these problems. In a recent CBS poll directed at parents of children aged 13 and over, quote, 90% of parents believe that their children have never used illegal drugs or abused prescription drugs, and 88% of parents believe they know for a fact that their children have never had sex or involved in any of the problems above mentioned, end quote. Compare and contrast for a moment what parents believe about their teens and what their teens are actually involved in. Unfortunately, it does not align. Now, no one wants to believe any of these things are happening to their friends or to their children, more importantly. And this is exactly the case with my friend Joshua. To this day, his parents do not know about his suicide attempts or depression. He's lived in fear of his parents' regard for him and had to hide his sin. The second myth says that these teens are not in the church or among the Christian community. The fact of the matter is that they are precisely who is in the church. 
According to a survey conducted by the Barna Group, known for studying behaviors among the Christian community, quote, social peer pressures and parental pressures more than double once a child reaches high school. These pressures can take many forms, including using drugs and alcohol, befriending certain groups of peers, having sexual experiences, wearing certain types of brands or clothing, or possessing a certain attitude, end quote. How can these children raised in loving Christian households who only want what's best for them resort to self-hatred, cutting, drugs, sex, and suicide? So this brings me to my next point, and this is why are these teens broken? One answer is that they are missing the blessing. Listen to my friend Josh in an email he sent me. Quote, I'm just too overwhelmed. There's too much pressure. I feel like I'm going insane, and the next thing I know, I'm planning my own suicide attempt. All I know is that I can't tell my parents. Mom and Dad expect me to live up to the standard that they've set. Please don't tell them, Christine. I know something like Mom and Dad knowing would push me over the edge, end quote. Josh is on a treadmill to earn his parents' satisfaction. In their book, The Blessing, Dr. John Trent and Gary Smalley discuss the significance of a parent's blessing. They say, quote, all of us long to be accepted by others. This yearning is particularly true with our relationship with our parents. If a child feels as though he's never quite measuring up, this lack of acceptance, as minor as it may be and sometimes unconscious to the parent, usually sets off a lifelong search in that individual, end quote. So this brings me to my final point in my speech, and that is, how do we stop this pain, stop this trend, and continue having healthy teenagers? According to Dr. Ted Tripp, we can shepherd our children's heart. In his book entitled Shepherding Our Children's Heart, Dr. Ted Tripp explains that a parent's job is to guide or shepherd his or her child into understanding himself, his world, and his responses to that crazy world. The shepherding process is, quote, a richer interaction than telling your child what to do. It involves open and honest communication between the two of you, unfolding in a meaningful and purposeful relationship. The communication must be a dialogue, not a monologue on the parent's behalf. You should seek to talk with your children, not at your children, end quote. Another thing that we can do is love and respect our children. In her book entitled Reaping the Harvest, Diana Waring says that to love and respect one's children is not only the most important thing for any parent to do, it's probably also the most difficult thing. She says, no matter what anyone thinks about us or our children, God would have us reply, quote, Lord, I don't care what anyone thinks about me or my children. Lord, give me your heart and your passion for my child, end quote. Being accepted and loved as to accepted and loved as human beings is essential. And do you care about us, not just what we do or who we become? Finally, we can uh, become students of our children and learn their bent. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Yet a shocking 88% of children raised in evangelical homes leave the church once they turn 18, never to return, says Zan Tyler in her book entitled Seven Tools for Cultivating Your Child's Potential. In her book, Zan suggests that, quote, training up a child in the way he should go is training up a child in the way he is bent, not according to the parents' bent or the parents' wishes, but according to the way the Lord made that child, end quote. Well, what about those of you who may not be parents yet? Well, I would ask that you pray for us teenagers. We're the next generation of leaders, and daily we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and we could definitely use your prayers. Another thing that anyone can do, no matter age, is you can look for and reach out to broken teenagers. We might be a little awkward and uncomfortable at times, but we certainly recognize a friend, someone who's willing to listen to us and not judge us despite our shortcomings. Today, we've analyzed the lives of broken teenagers, and looking at who they are, we saw that they are among our children, and they are in the Christian community. We also analyzed one way teenagers can become broken, and finally, some methods for reversing this trend and continuing and having strong, godly teenagers. My friend Josh, he's doing well now, and after he confided in me, I enlisted the help of the only adult he trusted, the only adult he would allow me to, and at that time, it was his pastor. After battling suicide and depression for more than three years, Josh now has a full life. He commented to me just the other day saying, quote, I love life, and I don't know how I ever thought it was helpful to waste it, end quote. We teens were the next generation, and like any generation, we're struggling. I ask that you help me by helping my peers. Today, with recognition of the problem, hope, love, respect, and we can change the future by helping my generation today. Will you help me?